Okay. <clears throat> Hello, I, I'm Michael Ashby. I had the impression this morning that the sound reinforcement system was being temperamental. Is it working at the moment? Am I audible right at the back? Yeah. How do you know? You're What I uh, want to do in this lecture is explain some of the main ideas in English intonation, introduce some of the key terms and concepts that you're going to need as you study the subject in more detail over the next two weeks. And you see on your handout you have a list of uh, topics that are going to be covered. These are the things that I'm going to talk about this afternoon. And by the end of the lecture, I hope you will understand these ideas. And not only understand them, also be able to explain them to each other, write down your own definitions of these things. And furthermore, that you'll be able to perform bits of English that illustrate them. So, I'm not interested only in the theory here, but also in the practice, so that you can demonstrate the categories in terms of learning about. Well, everybody knows that phonetics has to do with vowels and consonants. That's why we have an international phonetic alphabet to write the vowels and consonants. And another name for those speech sounds, the vowels and consonants, is segments. A segment is just a speech sound, whether a vowel or a consonant. One of the practice books in your pack is called Exercises on Phonetic Segments. It could just as well have been called Exercises on Vowels and Consonants. They mean the same thing. But if we only studied segments, if we only studied vowels and consonants, we would never discover stress, rhythm, and intonation at all. Because they're not in the individual segments, or at least only tiny snapshots of them are in the individual segments. Things like stress and rhythm and intonation only emerge when we look at longer stretches of speech, old syllables or sequences of syllables, right up to old utterances. And that is why we talk about suprasegmentals, stress, rhythm, intonation, not segmental features, but suprasegmentals. Segments of the vowels and consonants, speech isn't just a string of those, on top of those, there's other important stuff going on. And these features of speech that span a number of individual sounds are called suprasegmental. In Latin, the prefix supra means beyond or above, so it means beyond, above the segments. There is another term, prosodic, which is on your handout and also on the screen. Prosodic, in this context, means exactly the same as suprasegmental. Prosodic features, like, seg uh, like suprasegmental features, are those which spread over syllables or sequences of syllables. <coughs> now, what is it that conveys suprasegmental features to the listener? For the most part, it's these audible qualities in speech that carry the information about stress and rhythm and intonation to the listener. Loudness, length, that is the duration of particular portions of the speech signal, and pitch. Now, I probably don't need to say much about loudness or length. It's obvious what those are. But maybe just a note about pitch. Pitch is a perceptual scale, a perceptual dimension on which we can range sounds going from low to high. We listen to a sound, we say, that has a low pitch. 
listen to another sound and say that it has a high pitch. When we uh, want to represent pitch in speech, we can do it graphically by putting marks on a stave, an interlinear representation, which is a bit like music, a bit like music, in that the low pitches are at the bottom and the high pitches are at the top. And the idea is that these dots, sometimes accompanied by lines, represent the syllables in the speech. I'll have more to say about syllables in a bit. And the position on the stage tells us about the pitch. Some of you are probably thinking, I can't sing, I can't play a musical instrument, I can't hear pitches. Every year people tell me they are tone deaf and they will never be able to understand intonation. It isn't true. I have never ever met anybody to whom I could not teach English intonation. Uh, if you can talk, then you can do it. Because you must be able to hear in order to talk, and therefore you can hear intonation. So there's nothing to be afraid of. No great musical skill is involved. I certainly can't sing, and nor can I play a musical instrument. So you don't need those skills. Many of you probably are much better at judging pitch than I am. If you are singers or musicians, you already have good pitch judgment. The rest of us, well, we can manage perfectly well. The pitch that we judge, the pitch we hear when we're listening to speech, is related to, mainly related to one physical property, which is the frequency of vibration of the vocal folds in the larynx. When we make voice sounds, we make our vocal folds vibrate, we can control the frequency of vibration, and roughly speaking, when the frequency is low, we hear a low pitch, when the frequency is high, we hear a high pitch. But, as perceivers of speech, we do something very clever on top of that. Because we are able to make allowances for the differences between people. We listen to different speakers talking, and we can still say, that's a low pitch, or that's a high pitch, even though the talkers have different ranges of pitch. If you hear a certain pitch, let us say a certain frequency being sounded by an adult male. Maybe I can get up to 200 hertz. I can make a note up to or something like this. Now, that's a high pitch for me, but for a tiny child, it would be a middle pitch or a low pitch. But we don't mistake the child's middle and low pitches for high pitches. We make allowances for the differences between speakers. It's a, a skill called normalization, which means ignoring all the stuff that doesn't matter, factoring it out, and just listening to the patterns which the two speakers have in common. So we're very clever about this. After we've heard a syllable or two, we start to normalize, or tune in, is another way to think of it, tune in to speakers and know what is that speaker's low pitch and what is that speaker's high pitch. So, of course, when in your intonation class the teacher says, do this, the teacher doesn't expect you to match exactly the notes that he or she will have sounded. It's produced the same sequence of ups and downs in your own range. So, what would this mean, this series of dots here? There's one dot for each syllable in the sentence. The first dot corresponds to the syllable I, and that's to be said on a lowish pitch, I, the read would be I, I, like that. And then here I'm meant to go up to a high pitch, a relatively high pitch, for the syllable don't. I don't, I don't, like that, I don't. Having got to the don't, you see that I've shown the pitch going on more or less at the same level for a few syllables. So we get, I don't remember his, I don't remember his, da 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 da. Now something happens on the first syllable of telephone. 
It seems to start on the same pitch, but there's this line coming down. Clearly, that means a fall. We've got to go from the high pitch down to the low pitch. And having got down to the low pitch, we're meant to stay there. So these syllables at the end are going to be something like the one at the beginning, or shown even a little lower. We have I, and we want phone number, phone number at the end. So I don't remember his telephone number. I don't remember his telephone number. I'm doing something like da 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 That's all there is to it, really. Uh, it doesn't matter, really, how much you go up and down, as long as you do go up and down. And there are some exercises, some ideas on your handout, the back of your handout, telling you how you can build this skill up. You don't, you don't have to do it right now. It's something you can do before tomorrow. <laughs> uh, when, when we have people uh, for a master's course, for instance, and we deal with pitch in general phonetic terms, not just English, we like to train people to hear at least three pitches, a low pitch, a middle pitch, and a high pitch. So you can think of your middle pitch as the pitch that it's comfortable to start talking on, just a comfortable pitch. Your low pitch is a pitch that's noticeably lower than your middle pitch, and your high pitch, obviously, up from your middle pitch. So if you've got the skill of hitting the middle pitch, and a low pitch, and a high pitch, and doing this in any order, you'll be able to copy any intonation pattern that you want. So you, between now and tomorrow, as you go about your sightseeing, and shopping, and eating, and all the other things, I like to think you'll be going around saying, low, 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 high, mid, mid, mid. <laughs> <laughs> high, 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 mid, mid, low, low. <laughs> be sure that you can hit the pitches in any order. I have encountered people who say, yes, I've learned to do the three pitches you told me. They are low, mid, high. And then I say, now do it in the reverse order. Oh, I can't do that. They say, I only do it starting low and going high. So clearly, you have to do it in any order. But that's all. It's an easy skill to do. What is my next slide? All oh, right, yes. Just to show you that what I was talking about is not complete fantasy, here is a real fundamental frequency contour of me saying a sentence like, I don't remember his telephone. This is measured. Don't. Well, it's because I cheated. What I actually said was la 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 la, mm -hmm. so that it was voiced all the way through. Uh, when our voices switch on and off, there'd be little gaps in the contour here, according to where the syllables are. And you notice some details in this. You see, instead of being level, it's actually drifting down there, and then it goes up again before it comes down the, the first syllable of telephone, and instead of being flat afterwards, it's drifting down again. But we, when we listen to speech, we sort of allow for that as well. We expect the pitch to be drifting down, more or less, we don't take any notice of that, and allow for it to normalize for it. Well, we can go on and on with more interlinear representations. At the top is the one we've just been doing. I don't remember his telephone number. At the bottom, the same sentence, but a different interlinear representation corresponding to a different pitch pattern. <clears throat> it starts the same way. I is on a low pitch, and don't and re are on the same pitches as before. But notice that this syllable, which is the second syllable of remember, is now down a pitch compared with what it was there. Come down. So instead of going, I don't remember his, I've got to go, I don't remember his, remember his, got to step down. And then instead of doing a four, which is what I have there, I've got this pattern. Now, you won't be surprised to hear that this is a rise. On the first syllable of telephone, I've got to get to a low pitch. So this bit of up, up to there will be, I don't remember his tell. I don't remember his tell. And then I've got to go, he phoned number, 
Oh, 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 my God. I don't remember his telephone number. I don't remember his telephone number. So, same sentence, same number of syllables, same stress pattern, actually, same rhythm, but different pitches. Again, with a little practice, you can learn to perform things like this. All you've got to say is, this is my low pitch, I go to a high pitch, and then I'm down a bit, I'm right down, and then go up gradually through the remaining syllables. You'll have lots of practice at doing this over the next two weeks. What about syllables? I've been saying that supersegmentals are on syllables, intonation is on a sequence of syllables. Well, people worry about defining syllables, but it's really not all that bad. A syllable is a sort of pulse of speech. It always has in it one vowel, which is the loud central part of the syllable. In fact, vowels on their own are just syllables. If I say, ow, then the diphthong, ow, is just one vowel element our list of sounds, and it's a syllable. In this illustration, what I did was take the strange sentence shown there, Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled pepper, which you may or may not know as a famous tongue twister, or the beginning of a famous tongue twister in English, and the waveform at the top is what you get from a microphone so this is plotting just this, the signal from a microphone for me saying this sentence. How many syllables are there in this sentence? Twelve. There are twelve syllables. How many pulses of activity are there in the waveform? There are 12. Wherever the waveform is big, like there, 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 and so on, we've got the vowel in the syllable. Between the syllables are consonants. Many of them in this sentence are voiceless consonants. A lot of them are P's. So when I close my lips for each P and turn my voice off, the waveform stops briefly. So, for instance, that is where I begin to say pi, piper, this bit here is the P. That's the T in Peter. Peter, piper, Peter, pepper, pickled, pepper. Okay. So, one pulse of speech for each syllable. There are various kinds of syllables. Here we come on to a place where you have to start remembering the definitions very carefully. Otherwise, when I talk about different kinds of syllable in future, you will be in a muddle. Starting with the general idea of syllable, there are two kinds. One kind called weak or reduced, and the other kind called Strong. This has nothing to do with stress and so on at the moment. This has to do with the composition of the syllable. A syllable is a weak syllable if it has in it one of the three weak or reduced vowels in our system, the most important one of which is schwa. Those syllables are permanently weak. You can't do anything with them. Once they've got those vowels in them, they're weak stay weak, you can't promote them to strong, they're meant to be like that. A strong syllable, or a full syllable, is one that has in any of the other vowels and diphthongs on your list. So whether long or short vowel, whether monophthong or diphthong, provided it's not schwa and ikku, the other two weak ones, then the syllable will be strong. If a syllable is strong, 
then we can start to make it even stronger, or as we say, more prominent. Prominence is just a general name for the degree of noticeability of a syllable. Okay, so there are various things we can do to make a syllable prominent. We beef it up, we put more of this, that and the other into the syllable and this makes it more prominent. But you can't do this with a syllable that is weak or reduced. Once it's weak or reduced, there's no hope, you can't make it more prominent. A full syllable can be made stressed or it may remain unstressed. I'll have more to say about stress tomorrow, but by stress, in this department at least, we mean that the syllable feels as if it has a beat in a rhythm. We can hear rhythms running through speech. Rhythms are kind of patterns in time where things repeat. And as we listen to a bit of speech, we can line up our senses of beats with particular syllables. The ones where we feel we can put a beat are stressed. Well, that's the theory. I know if you're not a native speaker of English, that's probably completely meaningless, and you can hear half a dozen different rhythms running through a piece of English. So can I, actually. <laughs> but I'll explain more about that tomorrow. <coughs> so we make a strong syllable more prominent, make it louder, make it longer. We readjust the timing of other things nearby so as to make this stressed syllable more prominent. And once the syllable is stressed, we can do something else to it as well. We may or may not choose to accent it. And in order to accent a stressed syllable, what we do is put a particular maneuver, a particular behavior with pitch on it. In the sequence that I've considered so far down to stressed, we can hear these levels of prominence even if we're whispering or speaking on one note. But in order to get accents on top of the stresses, we have to have variation in pitch. If we suddenly go to a high pitch, or suddenly go to a low pitch, or if we make a movement in pitch, either up or down, that accents the syllable. So we have various degrees of prominence. Notice that strong doesn't mean the same as stressed, and stressed doesn't mean the same as accented. It's particularly important to get hold of these ideas that there's a, a scale of prominence, otherwise you'll just be thrashing about and won't understand at all. It's very common to find people who use interchangeably the words stress and accent, and then they'll throw in a few others like emphasis, which I'm not using at all. Of course, in ordinary language that's fine, but here we have to define the terms technically and stick to the technical. This is to remind you about strong and weak vowels. The syllable is weak or reduced if it contains one of these vowels shown here. That one is schwa, first vowel of about. And in terms of frequency, the commonest vowel in English. Uh, every time we speak, whatever we say, schwa, 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 here there, over and over again. And the schwa isn't some funny weak version of another vowel that you should really be saying, it's just a schwa. Don't try and make them different just because it's written with an A or an O or something like that. That's wrong. They're all earth, just earth. In the transcription system that we now use, which is the sort of standard in the current dictionaries, there are two other weak vowels. One, E, as in the end of happy, we call this the happy vowel. Um, it's a bit like happy hour, I suppose, but it's a happy vowel. And, oh, we can have a weak O like thing, as in thank you, 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 where there's a very brief O. If these two are new to you, don't worry. You can just treat that as if it's ordinary cap I, this one as if it's the vowel of foot or book. A really crucial one is schwa. 
There's another kind of weak or reduced syllable, and that's a syllable which is so weak it hasn't even got a schwa in it anymore. The schwa itself has disappeared, leaving behind a syllabic consonant. And in a word like suddenly, 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 the N in suddenly does form a syllable, a very weak syllable. We have sud, which is a strong syllable. Then we have th, and then we have li. Li is another weak syllable that contains the happy vowel. I think learners of English sometimes struggle to make syllabic consonants. How do I make consonants syllabic? People ask me, and the answer is don't do anything at all. If you try to put anything into them to make them syllabic, you'll probably spoil them. They're just what happens when the vowel's not there anymore. So there is always another pronunciation with a schwa. I could say suddenly with a schwa between the D and the N. I miss out the schwa, I just get suddenly. Suddenly. You don't have to do anything to the N. It's just an ordinary N. It seems to be a syllable. The same goes for L. There is a possible pronunciation middle with a schwa, though it's very unusual to hear adults say that in the southern Britain, middle. Uh, without the schwa, we get middle, middle. Of course, there's a trick in passing from the D to the L, middle, middle, but you don't have to do anything special to the L in order to make it syllabic. Don't try to make it loud or long, not necessary. And a syllable strong if it's got any of the other vowels. Now, if you got that, you'll be able to tell each other over tea this afternoon what is a strong syllable and what is a weak syllable. Yeah? And give examples. Turn to the person next to you and tell her or him an example of a strong syllable. Quick! Come on! <laughs> a question. For universe. The question. The question is, the term schwa that I've been using, is it the name of a sound or is it the name of a symbol? And the answer is, it's both. Yeah. It, it's the name of an indistinct central vowel, er. Uh. It's also the name for that turned letter, e, which represents the sound, er. Uh. Schwa itself isn't an English word. We haven't got an English word for schwa. It's a Hebrew word, and it means schwa. <laughs> it, means, it means a vowel, a particular vowel. Yeah. 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 Is, it, is it in the Hebrew language? Yes. Because now yes. it is not. Oh, right. Another question which may be passing through your mind is which languages have got schwas? Well, quite a lot of them have. <laughs> Many languages do have a schwa. We have uh, a lot of people from Spain, don't we? Who is actually a speaker of Catalan? Oh, right. Come on, there must be more than two. <laughs> Catalan has a schwa just like English. In fact, it's got the other two weak vowels as well. Catalan and English have two important things in common, the same three weak vowels and the same patron saint. St. <laughs> George, yes. Probably that's why we have the same vowel. <laughs> And dark elves, yes. Other languages, plenty of languages have a schwa, although, again, many don't. Uh, schwa is an example of a central vowel. You only tend to have a schwa if you've got quite a lot of other vowels first. There are plenty of easier vowels around the outside of the possible vowel space. So, in a vowel system with only three vowels or five, you don't need a schwa, necessarily. As you begin to have more and more vowels, schwa is a good option. But you'll learn more about that as time goes by. Okay. Now, in that sentence, Peter Piper picked a peg of pickled pepper, what I've done here is transcribe the words, splitting them up into syllables, and deciding whether they're strong or weak. This particular figure is not on your handout, but it's so easy. Um, I don't even think you need to take away a copy. Here's the word Peter, which is transcribed here. 
If I was transcribing Peter, I'd put these two bits together. Here I've split the syllables apart. It consists of the strong syllable Pete and then the weak syllable er. It's no accident that the short form of Peter is Pete. When we abbreviate words, we commonly pick out the strong syllable from them. We don't take the first syllable. So, for instance, what is, what is a, ca a common or abbreviated form for umbrella? It's not um, it's brolly, which is based on the br bit, which is the strong syllable in umbrella. Pete is the strong part, Peter. You notice I put the T at the end of the syllable and not at the beginning of the next syllable. English does that. The T is in the strong syllable, Peter. Peter. Piper has the same kind of structure. The second syllable, again, is just the vowel schwa, Piper. It's very, very important to realize that you must not say Peter or Piter or something like this. You can't improve the pronunciation by following the spelling. Peter is just wrong. It's Peter, and only Peter, with an uh. So forget the spelling. Forget the spelling. It's a schwa, and it's exactly the same schwa there. So the second syllables of those words are interchangeable. Here's the word picked. Now picked, despite the way it's written, is one syllable. Picked. When I say a syllable has a vowel in it, of course I mean a spoken vowel, not a written vowel. So the letter E in there corresponds to no sound whatsoever. Picked is the past tense of the verb pick, and the suffix is being unvoiced in accordance with a rule which was on Professor Wells's handout this morning. That ending turns up in three different forms, but after a voiceless sound, which is what we have in pick, we get the correspondingly voiceless ending to picked. Here's another syllable, which is just schwa again. <laughs> uh. It's er, uh, not a or a. Uh. Those are completely wrong. <laughs> Peter Piper can't pick a, pe a peck or a, pe a peck. It's just er. Uh. Back, easy, oof. Okay. When we say this word on its own, we might say of. In the sentence, we'd always say oof. It must have a schwa. A peck of, peck of. Here's the word pickled, which may be pronounced pickled with a schwa. But this is one of those, like suddenly, where the schwa can be lost and we end up with a syllabic L, pickled. And pepper is just like pizza. So one of the things, again, I would like you to be able to do to practice is go through English sentences and phrases, think about the pronunciation, and work out for each syllable, is it strong or is it weak? Yeah? Is it strong, is it weak? It's weak if it's got a schwa or one of the other weak vowels in, otherwise it's just strong. Notice that not every strong syllable has to be stressed. It doesn't have to be stressed in order to be strong. It just has to contain one of the proper vowels. Now, I said that stress has to do with rhythm. I need to explain this some more tomorrow, but here's just an example to be going on with. There are very rhythmic examples of English. Simple poetry is often very rhythmic. It has a strong beat in it. We could use nursery rhymes that children learn, or we could use verse forms. This is a verse form called a limerick. You may already know about limericks. If not, then we're discovering something. And over the orthographic version of this, I put some accents to tell you where the beats in the rhythm are meant to go. If you want to try reciting this again to your neighbor and see if you can agree about how you think it should go. And then I'll tell you my version. So, 
It should be something like this. There was a young man of devices. There was a young man of devices. I want to tap my hand or foot every time I come to one of the beats. There was a young man of devices. Whose ears were different sizes. One was so small it was no use at all, but the other one several Can you find, can you find in this an example of a strong syllable that I'm not stressing. Yes. Sorry? Was. Was. Where? Young. A strong syllable that I'm not stressing. I'm stressing was there. Yeah. Yeah. Young. Yeah. Young contains vowel R and I'm not stressing it. At least I'm not. You might find that people wouldn't always read this with exactly the same rhythm. You might want to do something else. Uh, I think that I, I'd always read a limerick this way. Three beats in these lines, two beats in these lines, and then three more beats in the last line, where you get a kind of punchline or payoff. If you want to know more about limericks, you can find a, a book of limericks in the library, I'm sure, or in a bookshop. They're not always very polite rhymes, I'm afraid. This, this is an improved version of a rhyme that I won't tell you about. Uh, now, the terms that I want to cover, looking back at the list of things we have to deal with, we've dealt with what a suprasegmental feature is. Do you remember what it is? Yeah, it's a, it's a feature that's spread over more than just a single segment, or a sequence of segments or syllables. We've been talking about strong and weak syllables. That has to do with what kind of vowel is it? Stress, this is something we can do to strong syllables to make them more prominent and make them beats in a rhythm. Rhythm is a pattern in time marked out by stressed syllables. And pitch, well, we had to cover pitch in order to explain what was going on in accents and intonation. A little bit more about accents and intonation groups before we finish for today. An accented syllable is a stressed syllable, which is then made further prominent by pitch. So going back to my early example, I don't remember his telephone number. As you now see, the large dots mean stresses and the small dots are unstressed. So the stresses are here, 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 and here. There are four stresses, as I was saying it, but only two of those stresses have something remarkable happening in the pitch. The first one does, pitch goes up. The second stress, nothing happens, it's just the same pitch. The third one is the one at the beginning of telephone, pitch is coming down. And then here's a stress which continues a low pitch. Now what I want to say is that although there are four stresses and four beats in the rhythm, I don't remember his telephone number, only two of those stresses are extra prominent because they're accented. And the two obviously are this one and this one. There's an accent there and there's another accent there. But the other stresses are not accented. Not accented because they don't do anything special. If we go back to the actual measurement of fundamental frequency that I use, where are the accents there? Well, it's obvious there's one there and one there. The two places where the pitch changes, fundamental frequency changes in a big way. So, we now have a further division among accented syllables. Uh, according to what kind of accent we're dealing with, because I'm going to differentiate two kinds of accent. There were two accents in the example we were just looking at. Two accents there and two accents there. The second accent is the one we call the nuclear accent. It's different from the first accent because 
a pitch change occurs on it or begins on it. And as you find, the pitch behavior from this point to the end of the phrase is entirely dictated by the choice we make at that point. We choose a particular tune-ended way to finish the tune, and we start it on that axis. The accent where that happens is called the nuclear accent. The other accent, or accents, because there can be more than one, are premium. So accented syllables divide into nuclear and premium. But I don't want you to take away the idea that nuclear accents are more prominent than pre-nuclear accents. It is often believed that is the case. In fact, sometimes it's stated to be the case, even in print. But although the nuclear accent is extremely important, it isn't always more prominent just in terms of noticeability than the pre-nuclear accent. So the only way to find out which is the nuclear accent actually is to find all the accents in the phrase and then find the last one, and the last one is the nuclear accent. If I take any sentence like, what's the time? What's the time? There's an accent on what, and there's an accent on time. Now, time is the nucleus, but which syllable is most prominent? What? So, if you develop a way of finding a nucleus by listening for the most prominent syllable, you'll make endless mistakes. The first accent is often much more noticeable than the nuclear accent. Ah, uh, yes. The other example we're looking at, we have some pre-nuclear accents. There's one there, I don't re. There's another one there, member is, I don't remember is. And then the nuclear accent there is the place where the rise is starting, telephone number. So three accents. How many stresses? Four. Because each of the accents is a <coughs> stress, and there's still one after the nuclear. We're getting to a stage now where we need to be able to describe the other parts of the word group, the other parts of the intonation group around these accents. And so my last point for today is just to introduce you to the terminology needed here. The last accented syllable in the group we call the nucleus. It's one syllable. The nucleus is one syllable, and it's the last accent. If there is anything after that syllable, there need not be, but if there is, then it's called the tail. In this case, the tail has four syllables in it, including a stress, plus some unstressed and unaccented syllables. And if there's anything left at the beginning, before the start of the head, we call it the pre-head. In this case, the pre-head is the syllable I, which is a full syllable, but unstressed. I've been using the expression intonation group, and by that I simply mean a complete set of one of these things. A complete tune that contains at least a nucleus, possibly the other accompanying things, and then terminating with one of these tune endings, the nuclear terminals. Of course, the intonation group isn't arbitrary. It's a package of information. A package of information. Normally, it comes very naturally to people to know where to divide into intonation groups. There are some special things to know about English, but all languages certainly divide speech up into group types. Now, coming to the end of my time, or I might even have exceeded my time,